You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is the Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anatoby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. And finally, our third sponsor is 988. The Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline, 988 is a direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. That's 988oklahoma.com. And now, let's get into today's episode. Gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. I should say Chef, Chef Gabriel Lewis is on the podcast. Uh, thanks so much for coming down, mate. I appreciate uh, your time. Excited to share some stories and learn a little bit about you. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't have missed it. Yeah. Uh, so I did like, came across the Instagram, I think, uh, recently you did a, I think you were at Elemental and they posted something, you had something, maybe a pop-up you were doing down there, but that's when I saw it and I was like, oh, this looks like a podcast story. Let's talk about it. Uh, so I really appreciate you kind of diving on the podcast and, and willing to share some of your story. So when people meet you for the first time, like what's kind of, you know, what, what do you tell them? Like, who are you and what do you do kind of thing? Um, you know, generally speaking, when I, I introduce myself, I just let them know, hey, I'm Gabriel Lewis, you know, from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I operate as a private chef here uh, locally doing pop-ups and things and then travel, uh, you know, to, client, to suit my clients' needs across the country. Um, I kind of dance around the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, you know, just to, to kind of give people a, a straight and forward on who I am as a person yeah. um, and then let everything kind of wash over after. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, born and raised here? Oh, yeah. Uh, born and raised. I like to tell people all the time I was born uh, at Baptist Integris on Northwest Expressway and my first two jobs were right across the street. Where at? Uh, Chipotle and Panera. Oh, yeah, that's sick. <laughs> both love going to both of those places uh, for Two different reasons, right? Because I'm a big fan of the blueberry bagel. Big fan of blueberry bagels, always. And I put kind of, I'm kind of the guy who like has the fruit bagel, but will have like the meat and the cheese and everything yeah. else, right? I'm, <laughs> like the cran bagel, the blueberry bagel, whatever. Well, you got to have the sweet with the savory. Exactly. Like, and I was like, what is that? I'm like, well, you know, try it one day. Just try it. Uh, and too much cream cheese is never a bad thing. Uh, so the food thing. What do you, do you kind of grow up in a house that you just like? cooking food is just fascinating to you like how, how does that moment come around that you're like you know what I, i'm not gonna go and work at a nine to five i'm gonna i'm gonna be a chef and i'm gonna be good at it so it started um in my mother's kitchen i think a lot of chefs have that kind of origin story you know mothers or grandmothers um, for me it was my mother my grandmother and my aunt so i like to tell people all the time my three matriarchs are what inspired my passion to get in the kitchen and cook you know theirs were always kind of a emotional celebratory experience when it came to food and it was kind of that thing where I started off just being the guy that loved to eat and I realized that I could not wait for the holidays just because of the amount of food and the the passion and love that goes into that food and I wanted to be able to create that experience for other people and it inspired me to kind of get in the kitchen and start making it my own. What time was that? How old are you in that house? Uh, I first stepped in the kitchen probably around eight or nine years old. I didn't take it seriously until I was about 11 or 12. Okay. And then, so during this time growing up, are you kind of as well into, you know, not just food? Food is probably like the thing you get away from, but is it, are you kind of typical kid growing up, like sports, running around, doing other stuff, or you're in, I mean, it was, it was, was food the only thing, or are you into a bunch of other things as well? Food me? was my only thing. I was yeah. not an extracurricular kid. I did not, you know, stay at school longer than I had to. Um, and I just kind of fell into things that I love. So it was pretty much just food and um, old school 90s anime. Like that was my two things. Okay. Uh, and sometimes those went hand in hand. Uh, but definitely that was that was kind of my one thing, my one passion. And I just, you know, would even go down to, uh, I used to go to Bell Isle Enterprise Middle School mm -hmm. and had the Bell Isle Library right down the road. And so I would go to the library, walk with my friends. And when I would leave, I would actually check out books and it'd be books on knives or recipe books or things like that to kind of really yeah. educate myself at that point. 
So, so the first thing when, when you like, you know, when you're cooking and, and you start developing a passion for it, it sounds like you go down the rabbit hole of like, there's books on this stuff. I'm going to go and really deep dive into how all the process of cooking is. How can I make this with what ingredients I have and really quote nerd out about this passion that you now have. Oh, absolutely. Um, I went down the rabbit hole very far um, through not just books, but YouTube. Yeah. Um, Gordon Ramsay was my kind of guide at a younger age, you know, 11, 12, 13. I just could not stop watching YouTube videos on knife skills and, you know, how to break down a chicken, how to, you know, roast vegetables, how to make sauces. And it was just this whole plethora of knowledge at my fingertips, you know, being able to just Google that. And so it went hand in hand with the books. And so it was great to be able to put a visual to the words. It, I mean, the, the best resource ever is YouTube. Right. Oh, without a doubt. Like anything you need. It is. I mean, people like, oh, Google that. No, YouTube it. Because then you'll have a video of someone showing you how to oh, do yeah, it. Oh, yeah. YouTube right? University, right? <laughs> it's just the greatest thing ever. And like I, if I ever do have to cook, which I thankfully for my wife, I don't. And thankfully for my own personal safety, I don't have to cook because my <laughs> wife cooks. Uh, it, it's a YouTube thing straight away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, well, I think we're fortunate to grow up in a, in a time where we have that resource, right? You have an iPhone or you have an iPad or whatever it is, your, your internet connection, you can see this stuff. And then trying it real time is probably pretty epic too, right? It's like, and I'm sure you might do this with, with teaching cooking, is like you're cooking with someone real time while they're Zooming you or what, you know, you, that's the really cool experience. It's kind of like it's flipped now, right? You're now teaching other people. Absolutely. But when you're doing this and you're YouTubing, did you think like, this is now my one thing, I'm going to dedicate everything to do this and I'm, I'm, you know, don't worry about going to school or like, you know, in the traditional sense, I am going to become a chef one day. It was an automatic switch for me. So yeah. once I really got in the kitchen, I said, this is all I want to do. And I would spend my time when I got done with my schoolwork in class, just writing out what I thought a good recipe would be or like, oh, this would make a good burger. This would do this would do that. And it would just be a list of the ingredients. Yeah. Um, and then the procedures in which I want to use to, to make the flavors develop or pop from what I knew at that time. Um, but it wasn't even a, a diversity of interest in like, oh, maybe I want to go this route or this route. It was, I've got one paved road and I'm going to track down this road and take it as far as it'll take me. Yeah. Um, and I used to get all the time, well, you know, you need to diversify because you're not, you're probably going to lose interest in this and that. And I said, no, nah, I'm going to be a chef. And so it was never a, a, you know, I was never dissuaded from it. I was always just, no, this is what I have a passion for. I don't get tired of this. I love to eat. I love to cook. I love to make people smile. That's all I need in life. So I'm just going to run with it. Yeah. So you get that, you know, you, you turn, I guess, 16, you get your first job and you're like, I'm going to go to a restaurant somewhere. Yeah. I, um, so, uh, when I turned 16, it was about, I think a week and a half after that, uh, my sister was already, already working at Panera. And so it was kind of a, you have an in, get a job where you can get a job at. And so my family's route was first job Sonic. I think that's probably 90% of my family. Uh, my sister said, I'm not doing Sonic. I'll go with Panera. And I said, well, I'm don't want to do either, but I'll do Panera. And so I just kind of took that track and simultaneously went to Francis Tuttle to get my kind of culinary exercises gotcha. through that. So I was still able to express that outlet and educate myself in a way that was structured uh, and still be able to have a job on, on the other side of it. Yeah. What's what's it like going to Panera learning? I mean, do, most people listening would be like, you can be learn how to be a chef at Panera. No, you can learn things, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, you did go to Francis Tuttle to learn all the other, quote, degree stuff, chef stuff needs to do. I sound like I really know what I'm talking about, obviously. What did Panera teach you, though? Um, so to, or Panera taught me a lot about um, how to operate in an environment that is kind of fast paced or requiring a lot of um, multitasking, understanding how to deliver bulk food, um, understanding what a prep list looks like, uh, knowing what your FIFO looks like, your first in, your first out, making sure that you be able to put the freshest ingredients in the back and use what you already have prepped so you're not having waste, um, looking at what is and what isn't cross utilized. And Panera at the time was not great at that. You know, they would have single use ingredients for one salad and that was it. So if you prep too much of it and they only sold two of those salads, that's going in the bin. Yeah. Um, and so it taught me what to look for and what not to do as much as what to do. That's really great going forward as a business owner, right? Like I need to be as strategic as possible and use the ingredients I have. But also, like you said, that, you know, if we can have no waste, then, you know, you're not, you're not wasting money, right? That you've spent on those ingredients. Absolutely. So how long were you at Panera before you popped over to Chipotle? Uh, I believe it was two and a half years. Quite a while then. Yeah. So I, I took it from, I believe my junior year until about six months after I graduated. Yeah. Um, and then I just realized that the way that that franchise was structured at the time, I was expendable. Um, and it was when you, when you have that realization and you, you see that people don't have the same compassion for you as you would for the food, mm -hmm. 
he realized it's time to part ways. And so uh, my sister, again, was already working at Chipotle. Yeah. And she kept saying, Gabe, you actually can use skills here that, you know, you, you would be passionate about. So you might as well jump the boat. And I'm like, ah, I'll be OK. And it wasn't three weeks after that. I'm like, hey, you guys still hiring? <laughs> it just made the switch over. Yeah. So after you, obviously, while you're at Panera, you're, you're doing your school at Francis Tull and you're learning mm -hmm. all of the, quote, chef skills that you aren't learning at Panera, right? You're learning how to manage a kitchen and how to, I mean, all the other stuff, right? Oh, yeah. You know, they, they gave me um, what I like to, to really kind of lay it out in this way. It's like they they were kind of the the great foundation to build the house on, right? Gotcha. You know, they gave me the bones. They under, they taught me like, hey, this is how you do the stocks here. This is going to be your food safety training. So you make sure you don't get people sick when you cook in the kitchen. Um, this is how you operate in a safe manner. This is how you are able to stay organized, clean as you go. Make sure you're not having onion peels and knives on the floor. You know, they gave me all of that information and education as well as some other parts of, you know, food costing and really trying to give me as much of the industry as they could within the, the, the small amount of time that they have with their students yeah and it's obviously like you can't i assume you can't become go on to become a chef somewhere without this certification of going through school right? um you definitely can so that's that's kind of the argument in the industry is you know do you go to culinary school do you not do you have any kind of culinary training or you just hop in the kitchen and work your way up from the dishwasher to the sous or to the executive chef um and there's been chefs that have found success in both arenas um i have been kind of the odd one as far as having that middle ground of you know having a vocational education and then going into gotcha. Uh, competitive stuff and, you know, doing competitions and then doing the private side of food and then doing pop-ups in commercial kitchens. And so I've bounced over into different parts of the industry, but, yeah. um, you know, you can definitely do it without the training, uh, but the training definitely helps you not bump your head as much. No doubt. Yeah. So, so you, you graduate there, you go to Chipotle and I get, it's just another kind of notch on your belt that you've gone to Chipotle and you're learning more skills and mm -hmm. obviously a different kind of food as well. And nothing beats free food from Chipotle <laughs> out there, right? How much more as you want to have. Uh, how long were you at Chipotle for and how was that kind of experience? Being uh, so I was at Chipotle for about two years. Okay. Um, it was a great experience. You know, when I, I moved over there, it was, hey, we do everything from scratch, fresh in the morning. Um, you know, our chicken is marinated at night, cooked in the morning throughout the day. Uh, we make our guac two or three times a day. We make all of our salsas in the morning. And so that was very appealing to me because it's still fast, casual dining, but it's done in a way that has a level of integrity. Same thing with the ingredients, the produce, the dairy. Everything was either as locally sourced as possible or as organic as they could get it. And same thing there. It was a maximization of cross-utilizing their ingredients. You know, if they have jalapeno, cilantro, and onions, it's in all the salsas, you know, or if they had lime juice, they're using it on the chips as much as the salsa. Like they had a way of making sure that everything played a integral part of the menu. Yeah. And I absolutely fell in love with that concept. Yeah. D does it give you more of an appreciation for that, those two concepts now, like being on the inside and knowing the actual work that goes into you know, like the food that they serve you at especially a fast pace, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it falls into why I love food so much because there's so much, there's about 99% of it is on the front end. And that 1% is the moment that you get it assembled and it, it's, it's there for the five to 10 minutes that it takes for somebody to start digging into it. And seeing that on a larger scale is almost beautiful in a way that you can see how that system, um, you know, works from the back of house to the front of house, from the grill to uh, the salsa, the burrito rolling line. Um, there was just this mechanism that worked so well yeah. and just watching it play out was like watching a symphony unfold you know in, in the greatest ways it was fantastic and in the worst ways it's a train wreck <laughs> true <laughs> we've all got to go through those moments right we have good days and bad days what so during this time then are you cooking uh separately on the side for like clients do you have your kind of slowly building up a business and an idea of you know when i do go on my own i'm gonna go and have like a you know a high a, i'm gonna be a chef for hire and cook for private clients or are you thinking you know what, i'm just gonna upgrade to a bigger better better restaurant and just keep kind of climbing that and get a head chef spot what's the what's the dream at that point so at that point it was uh i'm cooking for friends and family okay. uh there was a lot of insecurity in where what's what my skill level was and what i was capable of doing in the kitchen um because you know they have that expression of big fish in a small pond right and so in my mind it was i have a great support system but that support system's telling me I'm great, but stepping outside of it, I don't know if I'd be able to stand on my own two feet. Um, so I really didn't 
dive into it as much as I should have. Yeah. Um, but that was heavily based off of insecurity and not feeling validated in my career or in my skill. Okay. Um, so I really just kind of stuck to my guns with Chipotle and then cooked on the side for people and kind of gradually try to see what they liked. You know, if, if I was able to do this or replicate something that they wanted to try, I think it may have been a couple of family friends that I did some in-house cooking for. Yeah. Um, but as far as, you know, really trying to get legs to a business, it, it just wasn't there at that time. So how old are you at this time when you're doing that? Uh, 18. Okay, so th that also can play into the insecurity side of things, right? You're effectively, quote, relatively speaking, young. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been in the food industry for four years now, Panera and Chipotle, and you have this passion for cooking. And I guess you're right. You're trying to find your feet and find your legs in, you know, it, I'm sure it's kind of nerve wracking. You're going into someone's house, you're going to cook for them in their kitchen, and they're effectively calling you a little kid because you, you are, right? Yeah. You know, you're <laughs> cooking for someone who's 40, 50, whatever years old. You know, most people who kind of hire personal chefs are pretty wealthy old people, right? Or older people. So it must be nerve wracking kind of, you know, you think, you know, I want to do this one day, but I've, I've got to build up that confidence. And it's great to have those friends that are like, come cook for us. Oh, absolutely. Right? To have those reps that when you do get that big, like someone's actually going to pay me to come and I need to like perform in a kitchen I haven't been to yet. Oh like, yeah. That's, that's a huge kind of accomplishment to do that. So when does it get to that stage or do you continue to work out, you know, do you leave Chipotle and go to another restaurant or do you think, no, I'm going to do this on my own now? So I was at Chipotle, I believe maybe five or six months. Okay. Um, and you know, I get off of work one day and that night my sister calls me and goes, Hey, I'm looking through Craigslist. I'm, you know, trying to find something here. And I had this random ad pop up uh, for MasterChef. And she knew I was a huge fan. And sure. she goes, Gabe, they're doing open call auditions in Oklahoma, which just so happened to be on one of our brother's birthdays. And she said, I think this is a good omen. I think you need to go for it. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, Craigslist is a scam. So it's, <laughs> it's a scam, right? Uh, and she said- I'm going to be in a ditch somewhere. <laughs> right? I'm <laughs> like, you know what? This is I'm, not real. <laughs> I don't want to go into a creepy motel. I'm good. <laughs> and she said, well, just Google it. Yeah. And so I do and come to find out it's true. It's authentic. And so I immediately sign up for it. And from that point on, I'm just kind of a nervous wreck. I'm like, okay, I guess I have to do this now. So I, you know, sign up, take time off of work and decide to go for that open call. Um, and fortunately enough, I, out of thousands of people were selected to kind of start going through the process of the wow. audition rounds. Yeah. And it wasn't real for me because I'm that, that person that doesn't try to count, you know, count the chickens before they hatch. And so it was like, okay, well, I'm going through the motions. I'm going through this. I'm getting, uh, you know, asked about, you know, family stuff, background stuff. I'm having to do these random blood tests and psych evaluations. And it's this whole plethora of things um, that ended up culminating into an entire two month process while I'm working. And uh, on the, I believe the day before my 19th birthday, I find out that I'm going to California to officially audition for the show. Um, and that was the point where I decided to take a hiatus from Chipotle. So uh, not even a year into the job, I was, you know, on a plane going to California. At 19 years old. At 19 years old. Dude, how awesome is that? Like, you're probably just like pinch me moment, right? You're like, this is happening really fast. Yeah, I didn't really have time to catch my breath. I was, I was freaking out. I was excited. Um, the minute that they said, hey, you have about three weeks to a month and then we need you on a plane. I spent every day after that practicing things, practicing different dishes I had insecurities in, trying to build up my baking skills, um, you know, working extra hours so I can make sure I could pay my bills while I was gone and letting my job know like, hey, this is not an option. This is a certainty. I am going to take a break. And uh, I could only tell my manager. I couldn't tell anybody apart from my immediate family. Um, and it was very nerve wracking. But because I had so many boxes to check, I couldn't think about how I felt as much, gotcha. which was a kind of a blessing in disguise because I think I would have psyched myself out otherwise. So you couldn't tell, they just said, hey, like, well, before we get to that, tell me about the process of like that open call and like, I assume it's like kind of America's Got Talent for chefs, like the whole, like you got a bunch of people there, like how does that process work in the cooking world? So, uh, you know, this was pre-COVID, so I can't speak to what it is now. Sure. But um, they essentially had us sign up with all of our information online and then said, bring a dish that speaks of you and one that you love the most. And once you do, 
we're, we not, we're not going to give you any plates, utensils. You need to bring all of that. Make sure you have everything you need to execute the final, you know, three minutes of plating that dish. Uh, keep it hot or cold, whatever. Once you plate it, we're going to have our judges, which were, I believe, chefs and instructors from different culinary institutions that just kind of travel to circuit yeah. uh, to try it out. And then we'll send you through the process as they, you know, grade you well or not. And so I made this Japanese style pork belly, you know, slow braised, and I crisped up the top and had some jasmine rice with it. And then I just took the juice that was braising the liquid or the liquid it was braising in and just kind of thickened it up to make a sauce. Um, and pork belly is notoriously tough. So I was very nervous that it wasn't tender enough. Um, but luckily I had it braised down and then it also locked in steam. Uh, so it was perfectly tender. They cut it with a plastic knife and fork and it was just a holy hell moment for me. Um, but that was, that was kind of the process up front. And then from there it was like, Hey, we're going to take you through this two month process of sending in videos, um, answering our questions, questionnaires, background checks, uh, psych evaluations, um, blood tests, make sure that you don't have anything that if you cut yourself, you get the chef sick. Uh, or if you know, you have something that we don't know about that they put pressure on you and you crack, you know, we want to make sure that everybody's safe and secure, including yourself. You're in a kitchen with knives. Exactly. Like, nobody thinks of that when they think of MasterChef. But as a as a business and liabilities, you've got to check every Absolutely. box. Absolutely. Right? Like, it makes sense now when you said that. But before that, you could have given me 100 options and that wouldn't be one that I ticked. Right? Like... <laughs> Oh, now it makes sense. Yeah, of course. Like, yeah. I need to check this guy's actually, like, not a psychopath. <laughs> it was literally a no no stone left unturned kind of thing. Wow. So why the Japanese pork belly dish? Like, what leads you to think that, like, um, to, to decide that, like, which is a tough question in itself, right? Just, you got to pick one dish that's like, hey, this is me on a dish, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That was the most... At that point, it was the best dish I could make, but it was also the one that most represented my style of cooking. Um, I fell in love with Asian food, I think uh, probably 12, 13 years old. Um, and it was just, the flavors were always my favorite. Um, and I think I was probably the only one of my brothers, my sister loved it as well, but my brothers were not as fond. And so I was the only one that really took after it. Um, and all of the flavors and combinations just really spoke to me in a way that other food didn't. Uh, but that was the most representative of where I was as a cook at the time. Great choice. And obviously it clearly worked out, which <laughs> is like, when you get that response or that email back, you're probably like, oh my gosh, I'm through the next stage. Yeah. Like dancing around the house, right? Like, is this a spam email? No, no, it's, it's legit. And then, like I said, you go through that process of sending in videos. And so once you get that initial email and then you go through this process, you could still like get kind of told, hey, we don't need you. They're still testing you the at whole way, point, right? Yeah. At so you're under point. high stress the whole, every, the whole time you're sending in videos. Like yeah. there's no... You have no knowledge of, of whether or not you will get cut or not. So um, with a lot of these reality shows, it's, you know, whatever far in the process you get, they can always say, you know what, better luck next time. Yeah. You know, so you never know. And the fact that that took, you know, an entire eight week, two month process like that was a little bit stressful because you're trying to make sure that you have at a drop of, of, of a hat the ability to pivot your life and restructure things so that it can be on autopilot while you're gone. Right. But you also don't want to be too presumptuous and put it on autopilot and not leave. And so it was this weird mix of, OK, I have to up my skill game. I have to work twice as much. But I don't know if I need to work twice as much, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm going to bet on myself. But it's betting on myself a bad deal. Yeah. And so it was just this whole crazy experience. I mean, but you learn so much about yourself and so much about your abilities during those times, right? High pressure moments that will obviously go on to serve you in the future. Oh, absolutely. Right. You know, that's, that's, um, you don't it, lack confidence now. No, you know? not at all. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's, that's an old, it's an old expression, you know, dime, like, what does it say? Uh, pressure makes perfect diamond or diamond under perfect yeah, yeah. pressure. So it was that kind of experience where it's okay. I'm, I'm having this weight on me, but this weight is making me sharper. So yeah. it's, you know, it's refining what I can do. It's making me practice. It's making me be more diligent. And it's things that I'm really focusing on now that I didn't before. So in, in, even just that span of time, I got better. Yeah. So then you're on a plane to, was it, was it LA? Yeah. You're on a plane to LA a few months later, you've got through all the thing and they're sending you to, I guess the studio now. Like yeah. You're so down to the last. Yeah. Few they few were, um, that was, that was the most nerve wracking at that point. Cause I had not traveled anywhere by myself. Um, you know, 19 years old, haven't gone outside of whatever a family trip was. If we took one, um, Oklahoma City, born and raised, spent so much time in the city that going anywhere was kind of foreign to me. So yeah. it was kind of 
really, really odd because I knew for a fact I was going to be one of the youngest people out there. And to be insecure about your skill level while being young is, you know, part of, of being young. But it's also that the thing of I can't show it as much because I don't want people to see the chink in the armor. And so I was trying to mentally prepare myself on the plane. I'm like, OK, whoever you meet, don't let them see it. Don't let them see it. <laughs> and uh, it was just it, yeah, it was just this really taxing thing where I'm excited, but I'm nervous and slightly scared because yeah. I'm just this is my first venture into the world as an adult. Right. And I didn't know you know what would come from it from there. Were you one of the youngest on the show? Were you, were you the youngest? Uh, I was the second youngest, I believe. Uh, we had one other contestant that was 18. Oh, okay. So it's not like you're like, hey, everyone else is 25, and I'm just like, this guy's just graduated. <laughs> yeah, it was it was us two, and then everybody else I think was 22 or older. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the thing of, oh, we're the youngsters, ha. <laughs> right. And it was still that kind of nerve wracking thing because I think the eldest was 50, 52. Got you. And so I'm like, well, some of these people have literal decades of cooking experience on me. Right. So we'll see what happens. And but then, so you're out there the whole time, like filming. Then. Yeah. Right. So from the time that I got on the plane to go audition to the time that my stint on the show ended, I was there the entire time. Yeah. And so it was a once I got off the plane, radio silence kind of thing. So had wow. no, no technology, no method of communication apart from, I believe, a 10 minute phone call to my family once a week. Just let them know, hey, I'm good. I'm alive. Really? Uh, yeah. It was the, the entire conversation was, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm doing OK mentally, physically. I'm alive. How are you guys? And it's like, well, how is ever? Nope. How are you guys? Can't talk about Can't it. Can't say anything. And so wow. my my entire experience was forming a new family yeah. because you have to, you know, either you make arc enemies or you are a family. And so my uh, season eight family is is family. You know, I just had two of them down here uh, last month to cater my sister's wedding because that's just that's how tight we are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. As far as actually talking to the family I've, I've known and loved for all of my life, it was uh, probably a maximum of an hour and a half, two hours that entire time I was gone. I mean, it's like going to prison, right? Yeah. That's kind of what I thought of the first time. Like, if I assume that's what prison is like. You get a phone call once a week. Yeah, they lock you down. And so you it's, are like under the under the gun, lock, you know, locked in, pressured situations, and then you get five, yeah, ten minutes to call out. I'm doing fine. Just to let you know, I'm still breathing. I'm yeah, still here. it was a, it was, and it wasn't a. Oh, I can maybe I can you know fudge fifteen or twenty minutes. It was, hey, we bought track phones. Uh, there's twenty of y'all. There's like two hundred minutes on here. Ten minutes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was fun. Well, and, and, and like it's, you're back to what you said earlier, like it's different if you're 50 years old and you're going through this, right? Because they're probably like, oh, no communications with my family's yeah. great, right? <laughs> Whereas like you're, you're 19 years old, you probably used to be on your phone a lot and used to communicating and texting your buddies or whatever. You're like, now I have nothing. Now I just like have to find stuff to do with my time, which is kind of a nice thing too. It's like you solely get to focus on why you're there. Oh yeah, it's, I mean, it's that. literally like just, um, you know, it's, it's, blocking out all the noise, all the static. And it's just, hey, I am only on the goal, which that was the greatest part of the experience apart from right. meeting these amazing people was being able to solely focus on what I love to do and being in an environment where everybody is just as passionate and hungry about it as I am. Yeah. And that was kind of the revelation of, oh, this is the beautiful part of this experience is that I get to not only pull from these people that I know now, but I get to compete against them. And, you know, it's like a steel to a knife. It just sharpens the edge. And so it was just this beautiful uh, experience in that way. And uh, as much as it did suck to be isolated from the people that I knew, it was great to, to be in a family that I, I grew to love. Yeah. What an experience to go through, right? Like what to, at such a young age, too, that's, that's going to serve you so many great things in the future to have that not only on your resume, but to have those life skills and have that just that ex life experience to be like, you know, I did this. I've done this. I can do this. I can do anything now because I've gone through something that's kind of as extreme as, as MasterChef is, right? Whereas Absolutely. People watch it on TV are probably like, we had no idea it was that bad. I'm not oh. bad, but like that intense. It's and that's that's usually what I hear because you know it's well you know it looks looks crazy or it people think it's in real time or you know it's like oh we thought this was happening like maybe you guys had you were just a week ahead of the premiere or you know whatever and it's no it is blocked out you know I believe the first season I was on was a two two and a half month experience and we were doing two or three episodes a week and when I tell you that schedule alone in that season was taxing. 
because it was, I believe, anywhere from 12 to 15 hours a day on set. And so some of that was on camera, some of that was hurry up and wait, some of that was doing interviews. Um, and it was just this long taxing experience because once you get off of set and you go in back to your hotel, we had curfew. And so it's like, oh, you have, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to get food and, you know, relax a little bit before it's time to go up to your room and start it all over again. Yeah. And so, yeah, it puts you through the ringer, but it does make you feel like, you know what, I've done this. Anything else is just, you know, a, a byproduct of this experience. So it's not going to be as challenging or as taxing. So take me anywhere, challenge me any way you like. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've, I've had my feet to the fire, so I know what it feels like. So awesome. Reset this real quick. But yeah, that like... That's that's so much fun. Right? When you look back, you're like, I've literally have some of my best friends from that. Like you said, you had two of your buddies in town for you know because they did your sister's wedding. Like you build a family around that because you're all under such an environment. You're, you know, you're all under one roof. We're living together basically, you know, and spending so much time with each other that you can't help but develop friendships, right, and enemies or whatever it is. Like, you know, I'm sure people wanted you to develop enemies for TV, right? They, oh, they, absolutely. You got to deal with that as well. You're like, yeah, we're actually really good friends, but I had to come across as if like we had to like fake a few, you know, arguments or whatever. Um, so, how long was that period that you were on like that? How long was that eight season for you? Uh, that was a. I was. I, we filmed. I think I was there filming for two and a half months, okay. and then it aired. Uh, from May, the end of May until I think the beginning of September. Yeah. I think I was cut, uh, near the beginning of September okay. on that season. So it was, it was airing for a while. Yeah. Um, I did pretty well on that season. So what happens then? Well, well obviously, cause you know, while the season's like, you're like, I know what's going to fit, you know, I, I pre-recorded all of this stuff. I know what's going on. <laughs> what happens then? Like after filming do they kind of while the tv show is airing do they does does master chef kind of help you out and like hey this is how you're going to start a business and kind of leapfrog from this or they just like okay great see you appreciate you like yeah it's kind of a hey uh this has been fun you're now part of the master chef family uh you know we'll send you media material uh, throughout the season to use on your socials sure. to you know help your growth and to promote the show um but that's kind of where they they drew the line um you know it's that's one thing about reality tv and i think a lot of other contestants can speak to that it's um I hate to say it's a turn and burn, but in essence it is. It's yeah. a little bit more involved in that because they're not, you know, treating you like you're disposable. Um, but it's definitely not the, hey, we're going to put the entire PR team behind you guys and we're going to teach you how to be media moguls. It was, hey, we've given you the platform. Yeah. Now just do what you will with it. Got you. And so for me it was, okay, I need to educate myself on how to use social media in a way that I can promote myself enough to get a public image. Um and I had a lot of other contestants that started on that same route. You know, some decided not to go that route um, and kind of appreciated what anonymity was. And uh, I respect that. And I, not going to lie, sometimes miss it as well. Uh, but they, they gave us the tools to, to build the house. You know, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't set the foundation for us on that. They were like, hey, build the house if you can build the house. Uh, just, again probably want to start with the concrete <laughs> yeah of course yeah so so when you get when you leave then and, and you think you know i've just done this i have all of this amazing experience and now like this quote resume to kind of apply for any job that i want or do what i want what do you what, you know what do you come back to oklahoma city and think you know what i'm gonna cook now i'm gonna do my own thing like what's the process after that well the funny thing was and then covid happens i guess yeah, yeah we wrapped that season uh december 2016 but it didn't air until may of 2017 so wow. there was a lull between that december to may period gotcha. where i went back to chipotle and said well i can't speak of it i can't put it on a resume i can't express that i've done it uh so i'm going to act like nothing happened i just went on a two and a half month I ate us. It must be so hard. Oh, it was difficult. It was incredibly <laughs> right. difficult. And so I was just trying to make sure that my boss yeah. or my management team at the time didn't spill the beans to people that didn't need to have that information because I signed too many NDAs. Yes. And that puts kind of the fear of God in you of, hey, I could be sued very much. I never lift a knife again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. they, they, no, I'm good on that. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of went back into anonymity for that, that period of time and just went back to my job. Um, and then when the show started popping off, um, I still worked there throughout it and was hosting watch parties. And that's when I started trying to do a couple of pop-ups and things like that. That must be so tough. You're like, I've just got done cooking for like some of the best chefs in the world, you know, like, like as judges, you know, you're cooking for Gordon Ramsay and a bunch of other people. 
and now you have to cook for a bunch of sorority girls at Chipotle and be like, hey man, this guac isn't as good as you think it is. You're like, oh, well, you have no idea how good that guac is. <laughs> like, that must be so hard to like bite your lip and be like, you have no idea who just made your food. Well, here's <laughs> the thing. It My, my issue is, um, I and I, I think a lot of chefs probably share in the same ideology or issue is that we, we're gluttons for punishment. So right. when we think something is too mundane or too easy, we make it more, we just make it more difficult. Of course. And so, uh, in Chipotle, when I worked there at the time, it was grill one, grill two. And so during the most you know busy hours of lunch or dinner, you had two people working that position. Uh, I go, I'll do it myself. And so it was to the point where I am rushing back to the back, scrubbing my own pots. I'm cooking, you know, five, six pots of beans at a time. I'm throwing rice cooker, a rice in the rice cooker while I'm grilling chicken, while I'm grilling steak, while I'm cooking fajitas. And so I was just multifaceted to the point where I have a line out the door and I'm the only person cooking food for the entire store. And so that was how I kind of dealt with um, that going back to kind of an almost mundane style right. of cooking versus that high pressure was to develop that pressure in the environment that I was in. Yeah. At Chipotle off the tip. Yeah. <laughs> <in Oklahoma City. laughs> uh, that's so cool though. You're like, I crave like stress and, you know, like super kind of stressful environment and under the pressure that I need to simulate that to kind of make it like get me a buzz of going to work every day. Right? Absolutely. Rather than just being like, Great, I've got to cook fajitas again for like, you know, the <laughs> 20th day in a row, right? Like, Absolutely. Because, uh, yeah, I'm sure that after you've been, that's the tough part, right? After you've been like as high as you have ever been, right? You're on the top of, you know, you're like, you're, I'm at my peak right now in, in all of the life experience that I have at 19 years old. I have peaked right now where I'm at. And then you go back. That's the tough part, right? yeah. especially when you're young too. It's just like, cause you don't have that full life experience of a 40, 50 year old person that's gone through the ups and downs. This is your first kind of down. And you're like, how do I, how do I handle this without like losing my mind? And also saying that like, you know, breaking the, I've just signed a bunch of NDAs and I'm yeah. like ruining my life for future, you know, potential chef work. Absolutely. Um, and I think one of the biggest parts of that, that really helped me get through it apart from just applying more pressure on myself was, um, my mom and my dad were always just a, whatever happens in life, whatever you do for success or failure, remain humble and don't let anything change who you are as your person, like be make it an integral part of your being. And so for me, it was, uh, you know, I did this, but I was fortunate enough to do this. And now I'm also fortunate enough to have a job that will let me come back after leaving for two and a half months with little explanation. And so that was kind of the, the mindset that I had was, Hey, I'm going to make it more difficult on myself, but I'm grateful to be able to come back to this job mm -hmm. and be able to, you know, make money to, to live and survive and not have to go, you know, start from scratch when I just built these relationships with these people. Um, and just, you know, thrive in the environment that I'm in. Yeah. And until I'm able to change that environment and shift it to one that makes me more happy or fulfills more in my life than what this does now, I'm going to be grateful for what it is. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so then when the show comes out, you can finally say, Hey, this is me. I have a personal brand. Like, let me do a pop-up and a collaboration with you. And the exciting thing for you over this time is like, people are starting to realize that Oklahoma city is great for food. Yeah. Right. Like you're like, I've known this for a while, guys. It's kind of time that you all wake up. But like the usual people like me that know nothing about food are like, you know, Oklahoma City is really good for food. Right. Like, <laughs> I'm sure you're tired of hearing that. Uh, but the good thing is for you in the industry that you're in, as the show is coming out, people actually like general public are like, you know, what, we have a really good food scene. And then they probably are more used to or more kind of susceptible to, hey, we should get a personal chef or we should do this. Or mm -hmm. We should, you know, like push the boat out a little bit and be a little bit more creative and not just order the same thing every week because that's what we do because we like routine. Um, so what is that process then when the show comes out? Like who is that first pop up and you're like, you know what, I'm going to do this. Like how do you start building your brand? So um, at the time MasterChef was doing um, collaborations with an online platform called Eat With. Okay. And essentially they operated off of the, uh, you know, 
platform of we will advertise this pop-up. You will have to provide the space. Uh, you'll have to shop for all your food. You have to do all the prep. You know, we will just put the platform for people to purchase from um, and then you can run it that way. And so it was supposed to be structured as a way to not only promote the show and get people kind of that uh, in-person experience with the chefs that they watched on TV, um, but also kind of laid the foundation for individuals that, like myself that wanted to be personal or private chefs and do pop-ups in that capacity to understand what that structure looks like. And so uh, my first go at it was with an eat with pop-up and a and b And so I took that platform and kind of took it off of eat with, uh, cause they, I believe their percentage was probably 18 to 20%. And I said, well, if they're taking 18 to 20 and my food cost is anywhere between 20 and 30, that means that I might make 50 if I don't have to help, you know, have people to pay, then I might make 40 to 30. And so I just start seeing the numbers dwindle. And I said, well, let me see what I can do on my own. Um, and I took that structure and then I started doing, um, private events for people in B and B's. And so I started partnering with somebody that was operating, I think, uh, five or 10 Airbnbs, and they made me their chefs that they would then promote to their guests, and I would start doing it that way. Okay. And so that was the, the start of my business, um, because the awareness for private chefs just really wasn't here. Right. Um, and so I was struggling to try to get my legs up, because people would not hire a private chef. They didn't see the benefit of it. Yeah. Um, and so that really did help me kind of get my feet wet and understand, okay, I can do this, but this is the way I have to do it right now. And then I transitioned from that into doing um, open houses. And so I started doing open houses and catering the open houses with yeah. mini bites or, you know, plates that people could take around and eat with them with the experience of being able to talk to me while the realtors are talking to them about, you know, these locations and these houses and that they're building. Um, and so it was a great kind of in tandem thing, but it was an ability or it was, it was an opportunity for me to network. And that also got my name out a little further. Yeah. And so that ended up turning into having realtors as clients to do stuff in their homes for their people and their friends and family. And then, you know, Word of mouth spreads faster than fire, and that's kind of sure. where things took off. That's amazing how like, how you grew the business like that. Like I never would have thought. I mean, I, my general background and day job is in real estate, so it makes so much sense to me now that that yeah, open houses when you have a luxury house, like you got to put on some great food or have a you know killer food truck show up or whatever mm -hmm. it is. You got to do something different, right? Because every real estate agent's generally the same. You got to do something different that like sets this house and this experience apart, right? And and most people like. It's tough, I think, for sellers uh, to, to... The open houses aren't for the selling of the house. The open house is for the real estate agent to show you how good they are and for them to grow their business. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize that. Most people think that, like, oh, no, an open house is to sell a house. I think it's less than 1% of houses sell during an open house. But it is basically to, to throw a party that they can say, hey, I'm really good at this, yeah. you know, like, and which is great for you, right? Because oh, yeah. it's all these people in a, in a, in a concentrated environment that are going to be your clients. Oh, absolutely. It makes total sense for you to do that and yeah. continue to do that, especially if the house is $2 million, you know, wherever it is, Nickel Sills or, or you mm -hmm. know, Arcadia or whatever, like, yeah, you want to be associated with that stuff because then it leads to you working for athletes and players and other stuff like that, right? Because if you're in a market like Oklahoma City where it's not common for people to hire private chefs, then you've got to figure out a way to make that the norm. Absolutely. Right? And I'm sure the Thunder are a huge, like, hey, this is the big freaking big flag at the top of a mountain or a big that says, hey, you should come and these are your, these are your people, right? You should come work here because these are the guys who are going to hire you. How do we break that door down? How do we get into that circle of people? Because once you're in, you're in, yeah. right? Yeah, it's and that was that was the most difficult part because that only that door only opened for me this year. Yeah, you know, I've been in, I've been operating as a private chef on my own since 2000, late 2017, early 2018. Yeah, and this is the first time that I've actually been able to cook for clients like that. Great. Um, my first big client was um, the founder of Ring, uh, Jamie Simonoff. He was. I guess him and his family were marathoning MasterChef during the peaks of COVID. And he reached out to me via email and said, hey, man, my son's a huge fan. We're huge fans. We would love for you to come cook on in, uh, in Missouri on this, this, uh, this farm that we have. Um, and of all things, he asked me to do barbecue in Missouri. I said, well, 
a challenge is a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> so um, I drive up there with my sister because my sister does all of my media. She's my photographer. Mm-hmm. She's my videographer. So we've been kind of 50-50 on this whole thing. Great Instagram page. I oh, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah she's, she's phenomenal. Um, and so we drive up there. She also plays sous chef sometimes. And I play, you know, her backup photographer or her photographer's assistant because that's just how we roll. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I get to cook and I'm teaching his son while I'm cooking. And he just goes, man, this was awesome. Um we're going to talk. And so I leave from there, had a great time, great experience. Um, and not a couple weeks later, does he call me and says, Hey, last minute, uh, would you want to come to California and teach my son how to cook? And so I spent a week in California, just tutoring his son and built a friendship. And I consider them as much as they do consider me family now. That's amazing. And so that was my first big venture into, you know, cooking for people of influence. Mm-hmm. Um, and since then that's opened up several doors. He put me in a commercial for uh, ring with Kat Cora, who was one of my culinary idols from, I think, seven, eight years old. Um, and so I got to spend an entire day on set just doing, filming a commercial with her. Yeah. Um, and that led to um, cooking for um, an NFL player, for Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and then from there, that ended up leading into, which was probably the biggest person I've ever cooked for, but uh, Sylvester Stallone while he was here for Tulsa King. Um, and that was a mind-boggling experience because it, it almost played out like MasterChef did where it was the day before my birthday, trying to figure out what I'm gonna do on my birthday, and I get a random, e- a random uh, DM on Instagram. Yeah. It says, hey, I'm the assistant for Sylvester Stallone, blah, 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 and I'm like, ah, this is probably fake, right? Then I get an email from my website, and it was an inquiry form, it says, hey, probably didn't see my DM, but I'm Sylvester Stallone's assistant, and he needs a chef for the Oklahoma City area, you were the first person I thought of, I'm from Oklahoma, I know your story, can you send a resume? And so I'm like, I need to call this person because this might be real. Lo and behold, uh, the next day, I, they said, hey, we'll put you on a week trial. So I started cooking for about a week and then I landed the gig for about a month. Wow. Yeah. All, all coming from the, the guy from Ring, basically just the catalyst to all this. Yeah, that that really put me in the spotlight of things, you know, yeah. because he said, um, he's like, you know, man, I, I believe in what you do and who you are. Yeah. And I want to see you succeed as much as you are passionate enough about your success. And so him doing that allowed me to not only have doors open, but it also gave me a different layer of confidence that said, you know what, my food is good enough that these people that are, you know, Mm well-traveled can enjoy whatever I cook for them. Yeah. And that was, you know, beyond that, that made me beyond happy. Right. Um, and that ended up leading to now I'm cooking for a Thunder player. I've got a Philadelphia uh, Phillies player that I'm cooking for. Um, and so I've got several different people of influence now that trust me in that way. And to me, that's that's the biggest thing about it is that you trust me to be able to deliver on not only what you're craving, but what you're fueling your body with, especially if at, you know athletics is your bread and butter. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it just it opened up doors in a way that I did not anticipate and set my career in an entirely different trajectory. I mean, it's amazing, right? Like, it's amazing because the thing with food is, like, you get a direct, like, response. When someone takes that first bite, they're either going to tell you, you need to do it again, or they're going to tell you this is great. Like, you don't have to wait three weeks to, for someone to fill out a form to say, yeah, you could have done this better. Like, you know there and then. Which is, again, like, when you're on trial for Stallone, it's like, uh, you know, am I going to get it? Is it going to be great? Whatever. But also, like, it's tough because everybody's different. Yeah. Right? Like, you could cook some for Stallone, and he thinks it's amazing, and I would be, like, spitting it out because I'm like, it's too hot for me. I don't like it, <laughs> right, because I hate spicy food. But that's that's the challenge, too, right? It's like you have to have that communication skills with the person you're cooking for to be like, okay, what do you like? Absolutely. Right? Like, it's- that's a tough part. Too. Yeah, it's the trial and error, the ebb and flow of, of you know, that's that's kind of the dance. And that's yeah. the the most interesting part is that the the clients that I have, like the, the people of influence, it's never a preference. Yeah, it's a I either want something healthy or I want something healthy that tastes good. And I have these allergens or I have no allergies. Make me something. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's to me the most fun and the most scary. It is simultaneously the best and worst part of the job. Because I'm like, oh, I get creative freedom. I love this. This is why I wanted to be a chef. You know, this 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 ability to express in that way. And then it goes, ah, oh, crap. If I mess up, this is going to be bad. 
Well, all right. One and done. Yeah. yeah. So I it's, for, I cook for Stallone once. <laughs> yeah. It's, right? it's, it's a constant bet on yourself. Yeah. You know? And so it's every single meal, like I got to do better. I got to do better. I got to make this, I got to make this. Mm-hmm. And I also have a tendency of not liking to repeat too much. Yeah. So for Stallone, I cooked for, I think it was four, it was four to six weeks. Um, I may have cooked him the same thing twice, three wow. times maybe. Um, and that was one, it was a, a steak yeah. or a, a veggie lasagna. And that was the only two things that I made him more than one time. Everything else was constantly different, 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 different sides. Yeah. Uh, if it was the same vegetable prepared a different way, I always try to make something different, new and exciting because it's, to me, it's like going into the grocery store and opening a mystery box all over again. It's, it's master chef every yeah. single day. That's your challenge. Yeah. So to that point then, why did you reapply to go again? Cause you were on two seasons, right? Correct. Um, so they called me last year's season. Yeah. It, yeah. So they called me in, I want to say June or July last year. Okay. Said, Hey, Gabe, long time. Want to talk to you. Sign an NDA. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Wonder what this is about. <laughs> and they said, uh, we're doing an all-star or a, a, uh, return season. Are you interested in auditioning? And I said, what do you mean auditioning? They's like, you'll get on TV, but you still have to audition for that white apron. And I told pretty much anybody that's ever asked, interviewed, uh, they said, if you ever had a chance to do it again, would you do it? And I'm a person that I can't live with the what ifs. I can't, it'll drive me crazy. And so I need a level of finality in order to move past something. And I said, you know what? In a heartbeat, drop a hat, let's go for it. And so I, I went through the process again they said, all right, cool. Everything's good. Everything's signed, you know, lines up. You haven't, you know, went to jail in the past couple of years. Like you didn't do anything illegal. We'd love to have you back on. And so I went for it. But the challenging part this time was we did have our phones and, and technology. Um, and that was probably the worst thing about it was I ended up working while I was doing this because I was still trying to run my business. I had social media brand collaborations that I had to deliver on. Um, and so I had to be in constant communication with my sister. I was doing voice or when I got back from set after a 12 or 15 hour day, I was doing voiceover work for videos. Uh, I was still trying to auto post things. Like it was just everything that I went through the first time, three times harder, plus a job. Wow. So that was, was it different with more. Did you have like 10 minutes again with everybody or was it like did they were more lenient this time because you were like returning? Yeah. So the leniency, because uh, a lot of the a lot of the returning contestants was like, hey, have we have businesses. Yeah, yeah, we have businesses. We have jobs. We have families um, that we have to take care of. So we need to be able to communicate. And so they let us keep our phones. Okay. We just couldn't bring them to set. So, you know, early in the morning, late at night, we had our phones. Um, and the two hour time difference, depending on where you are originally helped. So I was still able to communicate with my family a little bit more. I just couldn't tell them anything and I didn't. Um, but that part made it much more difficult. And it was also an episode a day versus three, two to three episodes a week. So it was Monday through Friday. Every day was an episode. And so having that level of pressure was insane because you could be safe one day and gone the next. And so the pressure was doubled and it was three to five times harder. Yeah. And so that was, that was a fun experience. Um, I, I definitely got put through the ringer on that one, but, um, yeah, I just, I can't leave any stone unturned. So if I didn't say yes to it, I had always been asking, well, what if you were in this position or what if you were cooking in that kitchen? Like, what would you have done? Yeah. And I, I can't live with that. So I had to, I was like for better, or for worse, win or lose, I'll go back. Yeah. So comparing the both of them was the- Obviously, the second time seems a lot more stressful and harder. But if you look at both of them, and I mean, what would you say? Well, they're both very different, mm-hmm. right? Like, because you're, you're such a you know, you've moved on so much, you've grown so much since you go back, and you have all this other stuff, literally, no pun intended, on your plate uh, to deal with running a business, all this stuff. But you still have your phone, like that's kind of a good thing that it's not the same thing. You know, like going back, you're like, Oh, I've done this before. This is just monotonous. It's the same. Right. Um, yes and no. If the structure was the same, I probably still would have had this, a similar pressure from the sure. first time. Uh, Cause they can still do the same structure with different challenges and it gotcha. would be, you know, still be as challenging. Um, but they not only, changed the challenges they changed the structure of the show since last i was on oh wow so it was like hey you only have one cook to impress and if you don't you're out not like a team of judges or yeah whatever. like you don't have oh we have a, a mystery box where okay. everybody's generally going to be safe and then you have the elimination challenge if you didn't do 
the best in the mystery box. It was, yeah. hey, if we do a mystery box challenge, it's also an elimination challenge. So if you do the worst, you are gone. You are one and done. That is it. Game over. Not to mention, we also need three plates. We need them to be identical, perfect. Don't lose anything. Don't leave anything off or that's going to put you in contention for elimination. Which, granted, as a chef, we are able to produce multiple sure. plates at one time. So that yeah. wasn't the most hindering thing. It was just the level of uh, precision under stress. And a lot of people don't think about this, but when you only have 60 minutes to cook, yeah. that wipes 90% of the things you can make off the table. Okay. So it's like, what can you actually prepare in 60 minutes or less? And this time, they also didn't bracket our shopping time off. It was included in our cook time. Oh, wow. So they're like, hey, you have 60 minutes to shop, prep, cook, plate, everything. Yeah. Go. Jeez. Hopefully you got a grocery store close by. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> they had our, they had the, the pantry grocery was- Grocery store on set. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they had our, our, they had a pantry and that was one thing that was different. The, the pantry was open for the cook. Yeah. So if you need it, if you forgot something, you can always run back in there and grab it. But you literally had to run to go grab it because the set is fairly large for what it is. Yeah. And so if you don't run and make good use of your time, you'll run out of time. You'll run out of time. Yeah. Does it make you think that like one day I'm going to cross the pond and try Great British Bake Off? Um, Have you applied for that yet? No, I am. I I I bake enough to get by. Okay. To say I'm I am an expert would be a lie. Yeah. Um, you know, I go down to Harvey's Bakery and I just stand in bewilderment. You know, what a place, right? I'm and glad you said that because you actually understand food. I think it's great because oh, it's, it's great. But it's phenomenal. And a Francis no Tuttle graduate. Yeah. You have a lot of context. Yeah, and she's yeah. A, a Francis Tuttle graduate. That, that you know that created that place and it's, it's beautiful it's yeah. phenomenal the pastries are you know super rich delicious flaky yeah. and I don't think people understand the level no, of don't. difficulty that goes you know with that yeah. um, so no I can't say that I would uh, if I had something like chopped or you know something that's that's very different um, I would definitely go for that because I've been asked oh would you know third time's a charm like, right uh, no no um, I'm also a firm believer in you know not taking steps backwards yeah and so for me going back the second time was conclusive yeah and I'm like you know if I want to if, if people want to see me in that arena I'm always going to take up a culinary challenge even if it is a baking challenge if I'm directly challenged to it give me prep time I'll learn some stuff yeah but um I'm always going to take a challenge on, but as far as, you know, going back to, to that one, no, but yeah, definitely. I would, I would love to do other cooking shows. Yeah. So going forward then to that point, like what is obviously, you know, you're still doing, you're cooking for people. Um, and I'll link your website below for people to check out, but you do private chef for someone you can cook with people, you teach people, you've got membership videos. Mm -hmm. What is your, like, now that you've kind of got this kind of foundation and base of this is my brand this is what I've done. This is what I've done up until now. Are you thinking like Chef Gabe's going to have a space soon? Like what, you know, what, what is your, what would you, in an ideal world, what would you love to do? Um, so for me, uh, I want to focus on trying to get my food to the largest audience possible. Okay. And so for me, that's through uh, videos and content. Gotcha. Um, so my focus right now, as much as I am on private events and my, my personal chef stuff, mm -hmm. it's building up my media. And so I'll be, like you said, my membership videos, I'm going to be doing a lot more of those at length tutorials instead of a 60 second clip on social media. So people can really understand that food is not as intimidating as it's made out to be. You know, I want to be able to make food as approachable as possible and let people use the videos and the recipes as a guide to get them in the kitchen and understand that they can make something great without it feeling out of reach. Yeah. And so that's my immediate goal. Um, but to say that I wouldn't want a space would be a lie. So I probably will try to have my own restaurant locally uh, open by reservation, you know, a couple times a month uh, in the next few years or so okay. in Oklahoma. Absolutely. Well, so would that space be like a none such type, very kind of small environment, Absolutely. In, gray sweater right, yes. type environment where yes. you can really like go balls to the wall on what you can, you know, small scale food, small amount of food, but a very high level rather than like having a Chili's or whatever restaurant. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, and people don't usually think about those concepts as so vastly different, sure. you know, cause a restaurant's a restaurant is a restaurant to a lot of people. Um, but Chili's is one of those restaurants where it's like, Hey, you one, you get what you pay for mm -hmm. Two, you're based on foot traffic and three, it's just, you know, they're everywhere. If you get a bad day, you're still going to go back. Yeah. Right. There's no experience. 
Yeah, exactly. And it's not about the consumer as much as, you know, what's on the menu and, you know, it's comfort, it's what you know, it, it yeah, is what yeah. it is. Um, but the beautiful thing about None Such and Gray Sweater is that they have crafted such an experience for their guests that the food almost brings you to tears, if not actually brings you to tears. And it's phenomenal. Uh, I know Gray Sweater even, you know, has their different water selections from across the globe. It's, it's insane. And so I want to be able to craft that experience, but the experience that is the Chef Gabe experience of, I want to show you food that is very, very tight, great, delicious, detail-oriented, but still doesn't feel so out of reach. Um, but definitely similar to those concepts, building on the experience, um, you know, the, the slots that you can book out, um, no kind of walk in kind of thing, but yeah, absolutely kind of in line with those restaurants. Yeah. Back to the kind of personal chef cooking thing. I know a lady, uh, or young lady, a woman who kind of does the chef thing too, but she actually has like an agency that like hire, like she works for an agency, I guess. Mm. Or she has like a you know, she's a talent basically, right? Mm-hmm. And then she gets hired, people reach out to the agency and then, hey, we got six chefs, who do you pick from? Yeah. Is that, th- and then she's kind of in Florida, so obviously a higher concentration of like very wealthy people, mm-hmm. athletes, people of influence. Is that ever an option here, like in the Midwest, in Oklahoma City, and being able to travel? Or is that just not, we don't have the pull for that here, the concentration of people? Um, I think if somebody... And no one's reached out to you on that, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, no, not not on that kind of platform. I do have people that reach out from different states that yeah. will say, hey, uh, you know, I'm throwing a party for my wife. I want you to come cook for us. Whatever your price is your price. Yeah. You know, and I've had, I've had clients that do that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but as far as having that platform here, yeah. I haven't seen it. Because she works, she would, I think she would go and like work for a client for like the summer, right? Or she gets hired or an actor, actor, or an actress comes in for a shoot. And mm-hmm. like kind of same thing with Stallone. She's working for him for an extended period of time. Um, you know, and obviously she's same kind of as you, right? She's, they've done all the things to get to where they're at. They're very good at what they do. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're very good at what you do. It's, it. I was just interested to see if there is that platform here. I haven't seen it. I yeah. think that if somebody decides to fulfill that need, they're brilliant. Yeah. Or if the person that's doing such in Florida decides to move, move, out. move that out or make yeah. it more national, it's, it's brilliant because it, it's the same or similar concept of, hey, we're just going to provide the platform. They're going to plug into our platform and we're going to get, you know, anywhere from five to 20 percent of whatever you're right. getting. And I think that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, if, if they want to do that in, in, you know, the South, the Midwest, the North, whatever they want to do, I have no doubt they'll kill it. Um, but to say that I've seen it here, no. Nah. Yeah. That's interesting with that. I mean, it makes sense because obviously Florida is more concentrated. There's a lot more, like I said, people of influence mm-hmm. there of all different walks of life and different industries rather than just like, hey, we have the Thunder here and a few other business people. But uh, that's super interesting. And there's a business opportunity if you can make it work, right? Absolutely. I mean, we're not that far from Dallas. And I'm sure there's plenty of people in Dallas that want personal chefs. Um, Finishing up, I want to ask, like, what was kind of like, and I'm sure people ask you this all the time, like, what's it like meeting Gordon Ramsay? And what's like the most impactful moment on MasterChef? But I'm not going to ask you that because I'm sure you're bored of telling those stories. What I want to know, though, is for you, like, of all the things that you've done up until now, what, like, one thing, do you regret anything? And what would you change? Um, hmm. So I I try not to dwell on things. And so for me uh, to say that I have regrets as far as my career, 99% I'll say I don't regret. Um, The 1% of things that I say I do regret was not maximizing on the experience the first go around on MasterChef. But that comes with the level of ignorance of, you know, I just didn't know. Yeah, you were 19 years old. Yeah, and so I I can't fault myself for being ignorant because I didn't necessarily have access to the things that would have educated me in that, that arena. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, I don't think I would change anything. Cause I feel like if I changed anything, I, it wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be who I am and it wouldn't be where I am right now. Um, so, you know, false warts and all for, you know, better for worse, all the injuries, burns, cuts, late nights, long hours, um, you know, stress. Yeah. I, I just, I don't think I'd change any of it because it's all worked into understanding what I can do, understanding my limits, um, and how I'm able to corral, people and, and educate or, you know, show younger chefs than I am or chefs that have less experience how to get it done in a way that's still positive and makes a good impact on the world. Yeah. 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 I mean, great answer. I love that. Cause every opportunity is a learning, every t- whatever that quote is, every opportunity is a learning opportunity, mm-hmm. good or bad. Uh, all right. Last thing. 
from some, some kind of local consumer advice for people in Oklahoma City, other than Harvey Bakery, what are like your kind of top three places that are underrated in Oklahoma City that we can get some of the world's greatest food here? Oh, uh, well, it was there was one, but it's it's now not underrated because everybody knows about it now. But Madere, uh, okay. I mean, phenomenal chef Jeff. Uh, I think anything he touches when it comes to restaurants is gold. Um, you know, if you want a private experience, the Crown Room, uh, Chef Eric Smith is phenomenal. Um, you know, that's kind of the the group deal. If you really want to treat yourself well, um, if you want that little uh, like kind of Italian food, Gabriella's is, is phenomenal. Um, I have unfortunately not been able to go to their new location, uh, but when they were off 63rd Street, I mean, absolutely delicious. Um, and I would probably say, um, honestly, for me, when it comes to uh, anything else, I'm, I'm a big fan of Golden Phoenix. Um, you know, I think that they are aptly named because I think they've probably burnt down twice. So they keep rising from the ashes and making something greater. Um, but their, you know, their, their duck or their char siu pork or, you know, just their, their barbecue there is just absolutely phenomenal. And, um, honestly, there's not much you can do to go wrong in this area. I think a lot of, a lot of what I speak to is probably in, you know, the class and plaza area. Um, but you know, go out to Edmond. There are a couple of DPs there as well. Awesome. Well, mate, thank you so much for taking some time out. Uh, excited to watch you soar and grow and, and kind of follow you. Um, you know, I appreciate your kind of, uh, the detail that you put into your social media. I think you realize that that is the best way to put, will you know, put, put, what you do out there and, and you and your sister obviously you're a great team and, and come together and post some great content um, for people listening I'll post your uh, website which is chefgabeonline.com in the description and then your Instagram as well which is the underscore Gabriel Lewis um, mate, it's, mate this has been an absolute pleasure like I, I'm I'm not going to become a chef because there's people like you in the world. Uh, and like it's much more enjoyable for me to like save up and pay you to do something than it is for me to burn my house down. Uh, so, so I appreciate everything you've done. Uh, I hope uh, with Tulsa King coming back for a second season, I hope you get that that second contract to uh, to cook for Stallone again. Uh, and now that you said his assistant's from here, I need to have his assistant on the podcast, uh, which is hilarious. But mate, thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. It means a lot. To oh, absolutely. Take some time out to share some stories and uh look forward to doing this in a few years when that uh when that when your uh spa is open oh so. you look you got first dibs man i this has been fantastic i appreciate it and thank you for shining a light in the, in the state man that's what a lot of people haven't taken the opportunity to do so awesome thanks man i appreciate it for everyone listening uh, like i said the links to uh gabe's stuff will be in the description and you can go hire him to come out and cook most of the stuff that you want him to cook uh yeah I'm, I'm going to save up and have you do that for one day. <laughs> Maybe a present for my wife because she does all the cooking. But for everyone listening, uh, links in the description and we will catch you next episode. Cheers. Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor. They do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma and without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And finally, our third sponsor for today, the Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline. 988 is the direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with the trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. It's 988oklahoma.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.